Okay, this is our third lecture on our unit of classifying matter. Uh, today we are going to talk about particles and atoms and uh, factors that affect them. So let's jump on into this and let me just first start out with where are we going today. So our objective today is to determine factors that influences particles and particle movements within matter. And saying that, let's dive into what we're doing. So in order to understand particle movement, we need to understand that matter itself, though it makes up everything, there is stuff that makes up matter. Matter is made up of particles called atoms. Those are two important words right there, so let's just break those down real quick. A particle is a minute or small portion of an object. So when I say a particle of gold, it's just a small portion of gold. Or a particle of a pencil, it's just a piece of that pencil. Okay? And then atoms is the smallest object that retains the properties of an element. So we'll go, we'll go more in depth on atoms in our next unit. But just to introduce this word here, it's the smallest object that retains the properties of an element. So basically the smallest you can divide something down with it still being classified as an object or a specific object to be exact. So we have our objects here. It's broken down into particles, uh, small pieces. That's about where we're going to be going today. Those small pieces or particles are constantly moving despite what uh, it may look like. So for instance, the desk that I'm sitting at right now, though it may feel solid, it has particles that are constantly moving back and forth. So no matter what the physical state is, whether it's a solid, whether it's a liquid, whether it's a gas, the particles that make up that object or that substance, those particles are constantly moving. There are three types of particle motion or three ways particles move. The first one is vibration. Vibration is just a simple moving back and forth. Uh, particles just vibrate next to each other. They move back and forth to each other. They don't cross each other up. They don't move around each other. They stay in a relatively uh, single space or a relatively small space and they just vibrate back and forth, move back and forth. Then you have translation or they translate. Okay, so we think of just like in math when a translation occurs, we're thinking like an object slides. This is the same thing we think in particle motion. Um, think about you see SL and translate or translation that can be the same as slide SL slide okay so particles that translate uh, slide around they have more freedom than your vibrating particles uh, they also have the tendency to slide past one another or move past each other okay so they're not just in this one little area they're not just a uh, sitting there and staying right next in this one little area and not passing each other up. But they're translating, they're moving all around and moving past each other, crossing each other up. Uh, these different particles are just uh, basically free to move as they wish. And then the final type of particle motion is rotation. Rotation is pretty simple. Uh, it's just you rotating around an axis, just like our Earth does. Just like me in this spinny chair, as I go around and make a big mess, uh, everything, all this rotating is just moving around an object or moving around a um, axis. So your three types of particle motion, vibration, translation, and rotation. And your particles, no matter what the substance is, they are moving within that substance. It can be a solid, it can be a liquid, or it can be a gas. So let's break this down and look, look at what particle motion looks like in every state of matter. So the first one we want to talk about is solids. The particles in solid substances are tightly packed together and are in fixed location. So these substances are more likely to vibrate. So what do I mean by uh, tightly packed together in a solid? You might have molecules just like right butted up next to each other. They are tightly bound together, and they really don't want to move around. They don't want to move past each other. They like where they're at. So they'll just vibrate really quickly back and forth. This is what gives a solid a fixed shape and volume. So how does that work out? 
Well, because these particles are so tightly packed together and they don't want to move past each other, that gives this uh, object a shape. Because these particles are also rigid, okay, so they don't really, they're not free moving, that means they're going to have a specific volume or a fixed volume. So solids, uh, particles are tightly bound together, they vibrate, and they have a fixed shape or volume. The next is liquids. So liquid particle motion, uh, atoms in liquids are loosely packed together and they take the shape of whatever container they're in. So if I'm drinking water out of my thermos, okay, or my coffee cup, or uh, whatever it is, whatever the size and shape of the object, that water will change its shape to whatever container it's in, or that liquid will change the shape to whatever container it is. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the particles or the atoms are very loosely bound together. These particles will translate past each other, allowing the liquid to take the shape of the container it's in. So, solids, really tightly bound together. Does not allow a lot of movement. Liquids, they are loosely bound together. They still are pretty bound together, but they're loosely bound together and they translate past each other. This is what allows liquids to have a variable shape. So take the shape of its container, but because they are still bound to each other or partially bound to each other, that's going to make it where it's going to have still a fixed volume. So what do I mean by that is if I fill my thermos up with half a deal of water, halfway with water, and let's say that is 300 milliliters, whatever that may be. I go pour that into some other cup, that's still gonna be 300 milliliters. Just because I switched the container doesn't switch the amount that it fills up. So, what we're gonna say here is liquids have a variable shape and a fixed volume because of their loosely bound particles. The final state of matter is gases. And particle motion in gases uh, is pretty easy. Atoms or molecules are widely spaced out in gases and they're free moving relative to each other. Um, this is what makes a gas compressible. What do I mean by that? I mean like if you have a balloon and it's filled up with air and you can squeeze it, it changes the shape of the balloon and you feel that the pressure, okay, the pressure of the air molecules are going to go to either end, end of your hand. So that gas is compressed into whatever space it is in. The littler the space, the more those molecules are gonna move past each other and they're gonna move closer together, creating more pressure. Because atoms and molecule, or gas molecules are really not bound together, uh, and because they are free moving, this gives them a variable shape and a variable volume because they can be compressed and like we've seen with balloon animals, you can turn them into all kinds of different shapes. Okay, the kinetic molecular theory is mainly for gases, but their assumptions can help you understand how solids and liquid particles also interact. So there are three main assumptions in the kinetic molecular theory. The first assumption is gases are composed of large numbers of identically moving particles and they move in random directions and are separated by what is considered a relatively large distance. So basically what that means is um, in a given space, there's a large number of gas molecules. And they are all identical. So if we have a whole bunch of hydrogen molecules in a container, okay, or we blow up a balloon uh, with helium, okay, in that balloon, we will have a lot of helium atoms in there. And there might be a large number. There's going to be a large number of them. And they're going to be moving in whatever container they're in. So the balloon are going to move in random directions. Now, each helium atom is extremely small. So the space between one helium atom in that balloon and another, though it may not seem large to us because we are really big organisms, compared to that helium atom, it is very large. Okay? Because these atoms are so small, the distance between them is a lot larger, it seems a lot larger. 
So assumption one, gases are composed of a large number of identical particles moving in random directions and are separated by relatively large distances. Assumption two, the transfer of kinetic energy between molecules is heat. So we're going to talk about kinetic energy in a second, but just saying, hey, the transfer between uh, molecules. So when one molecule hits another molecule or one molecule hits the wall, it transfers that energy in the form of heat. Third assumption, gas molecules go undergo perfect elastic collisions with each other and the walls of the container. Basically what this is meaning and what this is saying um, is the amount of force that atom has, that helium atom has before it hits the wall of the balloon or another helium atom in the balloon uh, is going to be the same as it transfers to whatever object it hits. So there's no partial loss of energy. So those three assumptions are going to kind of help us understand or at least look over how atoms interact with each other or how particles interact with each other. So far in this lecture, we've talked about what particles are, what each state of matter has as far as particles or what they kind of look like as far as particles, and the kinetic molecular theory. Now for the last part of this lecture, we're going to talk about factors that affect particle movement. So what's making these particles move or what, how can we change the particle movement within a substance? So particle movement can be affected by both chemical and physical aspects, which can even cause a change in state. Some of these factors that we're going to go over today include temperature, energy, pressure, and concentration. So let's start talking about how these factors, changing these factors, can influence particle movement. Temperature is simply how hot or cold an object is. I know, that's really hard, right? Um, increasing the temperature of a substance, so let's say I take my water in my thermos, okay? I increase the temperature of the water in my thermos. That will increase the water molecules, the movement, the particle movement of my water molecules. It will make them move faster and try to move past each other more and just move faster. While on the other hand, decreasing the temperature of the water will result in decreased particle movement. So let's think about this. My water okay, is a liquid that has probably the middle amount of freedom as far as particle movement. It doesn't move around, the particles don't move around as much as gases, but they move a heck of a lot more than solids. So let's just follow this through. If I increase the temperature of my water, those particles are going to move faster and more rapidly. If I increase the temperature of my water, it eventually starts boiling and turning into a gas. So what's happening here is my water molecules are moving so fast Eventually, they break the bonds with each other. Then they turn to a gaseous form because they're free moving or more free moving. On the flip side, if we decrease the temperature, we slow these water molecules down. Eventually, they get to a point with, that they don't really move around. They just vibrate back and forth. And that's whenever we get ice and it turns to a solid. So that's an example of how temperature can affect particle movement or particle speed. Concentration is another thing. Okay, so concentration is the amount of substance in a given area. Okay, think about this as, I love using the reference of sweet tea. So I have my sweet tea. Okay, I continue to add more sugar in it. The more sugar I add into it, the sweeter it's going to get. So the more sugar I add to it, the more sugar there is per gallon of tea the more concentrated that sugar is. Increasing the concentration of a substance will cause particles to collide with each other more frequently. So think about this. I put more sugar in that tea, it's more likely those sugar molecules are gonna come in contact with each other. While on the other end, if I decrease uh, the concentration, it's gonna make it less likely that those molecules come in contact with each other. So if I decrease the concentration of my sugar in my tea, then the 
sugar molecules are less likely to touch each other. Pressure is our third factor. It's the force that is exerted on a substance per given area. So what do I mean by that? Some of y'all might have heard of PSI, pounds per square inch. Uh, basically, this is a measure of pressure saying that every square inch of a substance, there's one pound of pressure of it, or X amount of pounds. So, let's think about this. As pressure increases, the forces exerted on particles increases. This can result in bonds being broken. So, my water. Always going back to my water. Okay, that water, uh, if I put it under a lot of pressure those bonds are going to start to break. Once they start breaking, then they are going to have more molecular freedom and be able to move around more. While if I decrease the pressure or the force exerted on the particles, this can also result in changes in physical properties. So just think of it this way. If I increase the force on an object, it's more likely to break apart. If I decrease the force on it, it could change, um, but it's not as likely to break apart. Now our last type uh, is dealing with energy. Okay, so we have three types of energy in which affects particle movement. We have kinetic energy, potential energy, and thermal energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So we're gonna see uh, on our illustration, as this bowling ball or as this ball is dropped, as long as it is moving, it is producing kinetic energy. So the second it stops, whether it's at the ground or we pause it for a second, it no longer has kinetic energy. But as long as it moves, it has kinetic energy. Potential energy is more, you can think of the opposite, the energy of a substance due to its position. So if we freeze this bowling ball at any given moment, whether it's at the top, in the middle, or even after it's hit the ground. Long as the bowling ball or the ball is stopped, it's going to have potential energy or uh, energy due to where it's located. The final type of energy is thermal energy. And this is energy that is producing or generating heat. Okay, so by this type of energy, you can think of rubbing your hands together. Okay, that friction as you rub your hands together uh, it creates heat. That's thermal energy. You can think of the sun radiation as thermal energy. Uh, just basically any energy that produces heat. We'll talk about in later units, exothermic reactions or heat releasing actions. They're releasing thermal energy. So thermal energy deals with heat. Potential energy deals with position, and kinetic energy deals with movement. With all that being said, that should give you a background on what you need to understand, or at least to start with understanding uh, how particles move and factors that affect particle movements within matter. Or this is the last lecture on our unit, so make sure you take advantage and go back at the video. You can always go back and look at the different parts and learn and review different parts of the video. Also, don't forget to look at this unit's playlist. And there you can see that there's types of questions that you might see on your quiz or your test or in other worksheets. And that way you can see how we process through these and how we work through these types of questions. Whether it's particle movement, classifying matter due to composition or state, or even understanding physical and chemical properties slash um, changes. And saying all that, I hope all this helped you out. And keep up the good work in class. And I'll see you next time.